Hey, Margie here. Hippocrates said that all disease begins in the gut. Well, our special guest today, Susan Brady, believes that the gut is one of the main root causes of osteoporosis. And in order to really improve our bone health, we need to address digestive issues and the gut. And that's what we're going to delve into today, the gut-bone connection. Susan Brady is a physical therapist, doctor of integrative medicine, and nutrition consultant. She brings a rich diversity of experience and knowledge to the healthcare profession. She's passionate about nutrition, believing it's the true foundation for optimal health and healing. And Susan developed a holistic treatment approach to address bone loss and osteoporosis. She calls it the bones method. And it's an integrative holistic approach combining her experience in physical therapy, nutrition, and integrative medicine. Susan has a private practice in Reston, Reston, Virginia, and she also consults and works with patients remotely through telehealth. In today's talk, we're going to discuss this gut-bone connection, why digestion is so important, how to tell if you have digestive issues, and what can be done from an integrative whole body approach. So stay tuned. Welcome, Susan. I am really, really excited to have you on the podcast. I just can't get over how our paths are so parallel and how we started as physical therapists. But anyway, I'm not going to go into your whole path because before we even get started, I always love to know the backstory. And so why don't you share how you got to just sort of where you how you got to where you are today and the, the work you're doing today. Thank you, Margie, for having me on your show today. And I'm really excited to be talking about bones, my passion, as well as gut health, which is also my passion. And you talk about where I started. I graduated from physical therapy school back in 1989. And what's really interesting is one of my um, very first jobs was working with a rheumatologist. So, you know, people with rheumatic diseases, uh, um, RA, arthritis, things like that. And I had a client come in one time and she kept saying, she's like, you know, when I don't eat sugar or wheat, my swelling in my hands go down. I feel better. You know, it's amazing. And this was like 1990. And I'm like, yeah, right. You know, sure. <laughs> and, and it was true. And she, she was no longer my patient after, the, after a while because she stopped eating things like sugar and wheat and processed foods. And she got better. So that's kind of planted the seed in my mind like, wow, you know, there's something more to nutrition. And, and I was always, you know, being an athlete and I was always concerned about nutrition anyway, but I never saw the direct relationship that food had on our physical health. And so then I went on and I got a doctor of integrative medicine. I went on to get a certification in nutrition because when I went through a doctor of integrative medicine, it was a very, very broad um, spectrum of information that we learned. And the one thing that I felt that I could bring back to my patients was nutrition. So I went on and got a nutrition certification and a post-master's degree in integrative health and nutrition. But what was interesting, I started seeing all these women coming into my practice saying, you know, I was just diagnosed with osteoporosis. I'm concerned about the, the bone medications. I want to try a more natural approach. And after seeing seven, eight, nine, ten 10 of these, these women coming in my office, I'm like, wow, you know, I better really start to dive deep into this. And so that's when I did that. And, you know, it just came around that I felt like um, osteoporosis was a great way to marry my two professions. You know, my love of physical therapy, as well as my love of integrative health and nutrition. And um, so when I started to really dive deep into the osteoporosis, that's when I thought, you know, it's not about calcium. It's not about vitamin D. It's about, you know, making sure you're digesting well, making sure that you are getting the proper nutrients, but it's also about exercise, doing the appropriate, um, the appropriate exercises, as well as stress reduction. And like you talk about being happy and joyful. Um, all of those things are just so, so important because stress can take a toll on our bones as well. And so that's kind of where, um, what got me to specialize in osteoporosis and bone health. 
Oh, I love it. And it, it is so true. I, I sort of got into it because my son had type one diabetes in college mm -hmm. and I saw firsthand, oh my goodness, how, how that affected his, you know, how, how the food was just such a major component in, in the chronic pain, as well as I was doing bone density. Um, mm -hmm. I was helping with different screenings and I, it was interesting. The people at higher bone densities who ate the more fruit, who ate more fruits and vegetables, I was just noticing anecdotally. So yeah, so I, I couldn't agree more. So let's just delve right into digestion and bone health and, and mm -hmm. how come this is so very important. Right. So, um, you know, Again, when I started my, my practice, um, I was looking at all these different aspects, all of these really, really important things that go into bone health. And I put to get together this acronym, BONES, right? B, balanced nutrition, O, optimize digestion, N, nurture the soul, E, essential exercise, and S, smart supplementation. And this is the way I address and assess every person that comes into my office. But what I started seeing and finding more and more of my patients were having digestive issues and gut issues. And I truly believe that it is absolutely imperative to correct the gut and get your gut healthy first when you're working with someone with osteoporosis. And, you know, again, I truly believe that digestive wellness is the foundation of health. You can be eating the best foods, you can be taking the best supplements, but if you're not adequately digesting and absorbing your nutrients, they're not getting to any cell in your body, including your bone cells. And, and you know, I always think it's so interesting that Hippocrates are, ancient father of medicine knew hundreds of years ago that all disease starts in the gut. And we're seeing that. We're seeing that in all of these um, conditions. And I believe that osteoporosis starts in the gut. So, you know, that's, that's just my belief. I feel like in order to strengthen your bones, you have, have to have a healthy, what I call gut system. And, you know, a lot of people talk about um, the gut and I'm pretty liberal when I talk about the gut um, and the gut bone connection, because what I'm talking about is looking at the whole digestive system, the gut system, which includes digestion in the stomach, absorption of nutrients in the intestines, as well as the gut microbiome or there's hundreds of thousands of microbes in your gut. And the whole system has to work together and every aspect of the system, um, you know, affects all the other aspects. If you're not digesting well, that's going to affect your gut microbiome and your gut microbiome is going to affect your digestion. So when I talk about the gut, I'm really talking about the entire digestive system. And that's such an important point because so often, people will, you know, they're, they're really trying hard to eat all the right food and do all the right things, but they have issues and they don't even realize, oh yeah, I've been constipated for my whole life. <laughs> oh yeah, I've acid reflux and I have to take, you know, the purple yeah. pill or whatever. And they don't realize that these issues really can, can be so important, such a root cause of their bone loss. So let's go into what things can actually inhibit absorption of the nutrients that we need. Right. Well, first it's, you got to start with digestion, right? So if you're not adequately digesting foods, all of those great nutrients that you're taking in aren't going to get into, into the body. You know, we have to be able to digest them and break them down. And so, you know, the whole thing starts in the stomach and the stomach has to produce an acid called hydrochloric acid. And this creates a very acidic environment in your stomach. And we need acid in your stomach, contrary to what a lot of people believe. This acid is really important for breaking down and digesting proteins, but it's also really important for dissolving the minerals that come in on the food so that they can be absorbed. If you don't have enough acid, you're not dissolving minerals such as calcium and magnesium and zinc 
um, you know, which are really, really important to, to the bones. And then the other thing that this acid does in our system is it kills off any bacteria or viruses that can come in. I mean, every, you know, everything we drink, everything we eat all has bacteria or some kind of microbe on it. So when the acid in our stomach starts to kill that off before it can even get into the system itself. And then the last thing is, you know, we need this acid in our stomach because it sends a signal to the pancreas to secrete its enzymes into the small intestine, which then begins to break down, you know, further break down proteins, but also the fats and the complex carbohydrates. So those things can be absorbed. So not only is the stomach acid needed to start the digestive process, but it also stimulates digestion and absorption further down the track. And it, um, you know, you talked about people taking the purple pill. Well, when we suppress that acid in our stomach, then we can't adequately digest our foods, which means we can't adequately absorb minerals such as calcium, also our fat soluble vitamins, such as vitamin A and D and E and K, all of which are really, really important to the bones. And, you know, two things that happens is as we're, we age, one, we don't make the same amount of acid in our stomach that we did when we were older, but then also there's a lot of research that's come out to show that people that do take these acid blocking medications um, they're at greater risk of developing osteoporosis and fracturing bones. So, you know, the first thing that has to happen is you have to have good digestion and that starts with the stomach. And then when you talk about absorption, absorption of nutrients primarily occurs in the small intestine. So the food gets broken down and then the next step is to um, get absorbed from the small intestine. So the nutrients get absorbed in the small intestine, go into the bloodstream, and then get dispersed throughout the body and goes into this, the cells of, you know, every cell in your body, as well as your bone cells. But you know, what's interesting is that um, your intestinal lining, okay, that, that is one cell thick, and that is the only barrier between the outside of the body and the inside of the body. And you think about it, your gut is actually on the outside of the body, right? So everything that comes in then has to be absorbed through this one cell layer thickness of intestines. And so this, this one cell layer is so important because it allows the nutrients to be absorbed into your body while keeping the unwanted substances like toxins and pathogens out of your body. So it's really important to maintain a healthy intestinal lining to make sure the nutrients go through, but we can keep the bad guys out. And there are many different things that can damage the intestinal lining and impair your ability to absorb nutrients. So um, inflammation is a biggie. So in inflammatory conditions like IBS and celiac disease, Crohn's disease, all of those intestinal diseases can actually damage your intestinal lining. And then, but, but, you know, so can things like inflammatory foods, sugars and processed foods and alcohol and trans fats, they all damage that, that, you know, one cell um, layer that literally keeps the outside, you know, the outside unwanted things like toxins and pathogens out and allows the nutrients to go through. A lot of different medications, particularly our ANSAIDs, those non-steroidal anti-inflammatories like ibuprofen can be very, very rough on the intestinal lining. So what happens is, you know, and actually the other thing is stress. Stress can be very tough on the intestinal lining. So what can happen is you damage this intestinal lining and um, it can cause something called leaky gut or gut permeability. So these intestinal set cells, they stand side by side and they're held together by what's called these tight junctions. But when there's inflammation in the system, these tight junctions start to open up. And now all of these pathogens and undigested food particles and toxins, they can get through into 
the system. And now your immune system sees these toxins and, and these toxins and pathogens, and they see them as a threat and it triggers an immune response, creating systemic inflammation. So inflammation that goes throughout the body and this systemic inflammation can alter bone metabolism and lead to bone loss. So, you know, your bones are constantly turning over, laying down new bones, and then some of the old bones get absorbed and there, it has to be balanced. But what happens with inflammatory conditions is that actually um, excites the cells that break down the bones. And what happens is you, that balance is messed up and it begins, you begin to lose more bone. So, you know, you've got to be careful about, you know, eating foods that are creating inflammation um, in this, in this intestinal lining and creating this gut permeability. So <laughs> long answer to your question. <laughs> well, we could talk probably five hours on this topic because it's so involved, but you, you know, you mentioned so many good points. Number mm -hmm. one, stomach acid. And I see this as well. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Wright in Washington was able to do the Heidelberg test, which nobody really does to really measure stomach acid, but show people with osteoporosis. I think it was 90% of the people mm -hmm. had reduced stomach acid. So this yeah. is such an important point that you brought up, so prevalent in people with osteoporosis, and just as you said, in people as they age, and something that isn't really talked about much. Right. And so, and so how, how do you test for it in your practice? So I often, well, one, there's a lot of signs and symptoms of somebody with low stomach acid. So, you know, looking at signs and symptoms, particularly things like, um, indigestion. And again, so many people believe that heartburn, GERD, indigestion is secondary to too much acid in the stomach. But the truth is 99% of the time, it's secondary to too little acid in the system. And we need that acid. And what's interesting is the more acid in your stomach, the greater the feedback to this sphincter between the esophagus and the stomach called the lower esophageal sphincter. And the more acid in your stomach, the greater the feedback to that sphincter to tighten down and close down. So you you don't get the reflux up into the esophagus and create that heartburn and that and that GERD. And then the other thing is, um, you know, people that have excessive fullness or um, nausea or bloating, oftentimes that's because they are not digesting well. And if they're not digesting well, that can be um, certainly a sign that you're not making enough stomach acid. But you know, you could also go one step further and test for things like, like these. So there are a lot of um, great, very comprehensive GI stool tests out there that measure things like um, you know, all of your digestive enzymes and give you some information on whether you're digesting properly. So there, you know, a lot of times we can work with signs and symptoms and try that first and then resort to. Um, looking at stool, stool analysis second, or sometimes we just dive in and do a stool analysis. Which we'll go into later because that's so important. But before we even get to that, let's talk about, I mean, there's so much research now, which is so exciting about, mm -hmm. the, about the microbiome and the mm -hmm. diversity of bacteria and how that really makes a difference for our bones, overall health, but Everything. Well, and this is something that I know you spend a lot of time with the people that you work with. So why mm -hmm. don't you tell us about that? And then we'll go into the testing afterwards. Mm -hmm. So your gut microbiome, it's housed in your large intestine, and it is hundreds of trillions of microorganisms. And th the truth is you have three times more microbes in your gut than you have human cells. So, you know, there's gotta be a reason for that. And so many of these microbes are what we call symbiotic. They work with us and they actually um, play a very big role to many aspects of our health. And as you suggested, our bone health as, as well. So they play a role in digestion. So any foods that get down into the, the um, lower intestine, they help to digest. They play a role in absorption of nutrients. These microbes also aid um, in the production of certain 
uh, vitamins such as your B vitamins, which are important to gut health, as well as vitamin K. And there's so much literature coming out now on the importance of vitamin K when it comes to our bone health. So the, the gut microbiome, these bacteria actually make these B vitamins and vitamin K. And then really, really important to the function of our immune system, okay? You know, you hear those Activia commercials that talk about how the gut is the first line, you know, the first defense in your immune system system and it truly is. So all these gut uh, microbiome, uh, these gut microbes are so important um, to pr protect against invaders that might cause disease, but also in the function of the immune system. And then the other really cool thing is there is a specialized gut bacteria that make up what we call the estrobolome. And the estrobolome, these specialized bacteria, actually help to regulate estrogen levels in the body. And as we know, in terms of um, osteoporosis, we start to lose bone when we lose when our estrogen levels decline as we go through menopause, and that's going to happen to everyone unless you do some kind of um, hormone replacement therapy. But this estrobolome. And these microbes actually help to regulate. So it'll take excessive estrogen out of the system. And we don't want excessive estrogen because it can affect things like, you know, um, estrogen sensitive breast cancers or ovarian cancer, but it also allows enough estrogen back into the system. So it's really cool that here we're talking about the gut microbiome, and yet it actually plays a role in balancing estrogens in the system. So there's just so many, you know, reasons why we want this bacteria to flourish in our, um, our large intestine. And, you know, they, they kind of tag these bacteria as good bacteria and bad bacteria. And, and I don't look at any of these bacteria unless they're truly pathological bacteria like E. coli or something. They, there are you know, um, opportunistic bacteria and beneficial bacteria. And everybody's going to have some of the opportunistic bacteria in their gut. It's normal. But what you want is you want more of the beneficial bacteria in the gut and less of the um, opportunistic bacteria. And when you get this in balance and you get an overgrowth of the opportunistic bacteria and not enough of the good bacteria can cause something called it can cause something called dysbiosis, okay? So that's an imbalance of the good and the bad. And again, that can lead to poor digestion, poor nutrient absorption, uh, systemic inflammation, all of which then can impact your bones. But on the other hand, a diverse, and this is something that's really coming out in the literature. It's not just having... Um, you know, a lot of the good or beneficial bacteria, it's having a diversity of these bacteria. Um, they actually can help with controlling inflammation. They can help with digestion, with absorption, and actually contribute to a balanced bone turnover and healthy um, bone metabolism. Yeah, and it's really exciting because you know the research is so positive in how it yeah. does help bones, and you know people have improved yeah. by addressing the gut, which is mm -hmm. which is just so wonderful. So let's talk. The nice thing is we don't have to guess at this because the testing really gives us amazing information. Mm -hmm. And I know this is something that you do in your practice. So why don't you tell us about the testing and how you use that information then when mm -hmm. you're trying to figure out what the best course of treatment for somebody would be. Right. So, you know, people will come and they'll have symptoms of, you know, indigestion, GERD, um, you know, all the different things we talked about. And yes, we can guess, okay, maybe the constipation or indigestion is coming from uh, not adequately digesting or um, dysbiosis or something like that. So we could certainly guess or we can test for these things. So, so again, you know, these, um, these comprehensive stool tests will come back and tell us, 
you know, what is the, what is the beneficial bacteria look like? You know, do you have enough of the beneficial bacteria? Is there an overgrowth of the pathological bacteria? So these tests actually look at the different bacteria in the body. And there are a few that actually look at diversity of bacteria. And so, you know, if, if one of these tests come back and the person has, you know, multiple overgrowths in the opportunistic bacteria and very low levels of the beneficial bacteria, then we know that there's an issue of dysbiosis. There are also, again, other, you know, a lot of times some an overgrowth of a particular bacteria will also have indications of other things like, you know, you can get an overgrowth of bacteria if you're not producing enough hydrochloric acid in the stomach. Or a lot of times, like I said, we need this acid in the stomach to actually kill off the bacteria before it comes into the body. So if we see a lot of bacterial overgrowth of these opportunistic bacteria, we know that the person probably isn't making enough um, acid in the stomach. So there are a lot of different clues, but it also looks at uh, parasites. So parasites, I've actually seen a lot of parasites in people and if people know anything about parasites, parasites will eat your, nu your nutrients and then they don't get absorbed in the body. And what's interesting is, you know where the majority of parasites come from is one from our pets, but also from eating organic foods because the whole idea behind organic food is that you are not excessively spraying them with, you know, these antifungals and antiherbals and, you know, all of these things. So there tends to be a little bit more parasites on these organic foods too. So it looks at parasites. It looks at, um, overgrowth of candida or yeast. You know, women are very familiar with vaginal yeast infections, but we can actually get an overgrowth in a, of yeast in our digestive tract as well. And yeast love sugars. So lots of times when somebody comes to me and just like, oh my gosh, I'm a sugaraholic. I crave sugars all the time. Sometimes it can actually be associated with an overgrowth of yeast. And, um, and these yeasts as well can, are part of the whole dysbiotic system. And so it looks at yeast. Um, it looks again at some digestive enzymes. It looks for inflammation in the gut. It can look to see how well you're digesting fats. And so many of the critical nutrients for bone health are what we call fat soluble nutrients like vitamin K, vitamin A, vitamin D. And if you're not adequately absorbing fats, then you're not getting these nutrients. So it looks at that. Um, what else does it look at? Um, there is a marker, um, beta-glucuronidase, which gives us uh, some, some idea of um, uh, uh, excessive estrogens and toxins, which then can give us insight into this um, estrobolum in the gut. Um, what else is there? Inflammation. Oh, so one of the tests I do actually looks at whether you're sensitive to gluten. So that's often a good thing to know. And then it looks at um, something called secretory IgA, which is the marker of the gut immune system. So there's just so much information that we can gather from literally one scoop of stool. And it just, it just really hones in on what we need to focus on. So that's why I love doing the stool, the stool samples. They, you know, again, I've been doing this long enough that I can listen to somebody's symptoms and guess what's wrong. But by doing these stool samples, it really tells us exactly what's going on. And then we can prioritize and address those things. And since you work with so many people with osteoporosis, what are the patterns that you've seen? Do you see, do you see the majority of people do have issues? With when this, yeah. Are there certain, are there certain things that you see that are just very common? I think it's very common to see dysbiosis. Um, it's very common to see poor, um, poor digestion and decrease in digestive enzymes. I would say that that is the two biggest ones. Um, many, many times what I find is the marker for particularly pancreatic enzymatic activity is very low in most people. But again, you know, if the pancreatic enzyme activity is low, it can often mean that you're not producing enough 
hydrochloric acid because it's the hydrochloric acid that signals to the pancreas and say, hey, produce more enzymes. And so if you're not having a strong signal because you don't have enough um, hydrochloric acid in the stomach, then the pancreas isn't going to produce the um, adequate amounts of pancreatic enzymes to, to digest complex carbohydrates and fats and proteins. And then when you work with people, how long typically, I know this totally varies, but then to do a repeat test, typically what is the time frame that you'll look at it again? Yeah, generally we can repeat a test. Um, you know, again, it, it kind of depends, um, you know, especially, so the other thing that these tests look at is something called H. pylori. And H. pylori is a very common um bacteria in the stomach, it's known for causing ulcers and things like that. And 85% of the population is actually infected with H. pylori. And so when we're working with someone with H. pylori, we, you know, we do a protocol for about three months. Um, I'd like to call it kind of a weed and feed. We weed out the bad, we feed the good, and then we need to give at least a month or two off of the protocol to allow time for something like H. pylori to grow back if it wasn't fully eradicated. So I'd say every four to six months we can retest, but honestly, you know, um, it, it also depends on, on just so many different things because you can, you know, it, it's a combination of, you know, herbals, as well as appropriate foods, taking out foods that you may, may be causing inflammation in the GI tract. It's stress because stress can have a very negative impact on the GI tract. So it's, it's not just take these supplements and I'll see you in three months. It's, it's an entire lifestyle that goes into correcting the gut. And if somebody is undergoing a great you know, deal of stress in their life, it's going to take longer for them to heal their gut than somebody that manages their stress really well. Okay. So everybody is listening now. And what, so let's say people are having symptoms. Are there some easy things people can, that everybody can do before they even get to the testing? I mean, I think it's so wonderful that we can figure it out because that's mm -hmm. what's so important. You and I both see this, that with osteoporosis, so often the treatment is masking it, you know, just let's right. stop this bone loss, but what's causing it. And that's why right. I really love the work that you're doing. But for everybody listening who may be having symptoms, what let's start from the very basic things that everybody can do. Right. right. And um, yeah, so maybe some share some really good tips with everybody listening. So in the world of integrative health, functional medicine, we, we have what we call the five R approach to gut health. So the first R being remove. You've got to remove anything that's irritating the digestive tract. And a lot of people, you know, know what's irritating. And is it that morning coffee or is it alcohol or sugars or processed foods, medications, like we talked about NSAIDs. Um, food additives, artificial sweeteners, gluten. So, you know, really removing all of these irritants from your diet to me is one of the very first things that you should be doing um, because all of these things can irritate the gut system, contribute to inflammation, um, dysbiosis and those things. So the next thing you wanna do when you remove these foods, right? You wanna try and calm down the system. You wanna replace or support digestive secretion. So like we were talking about, you know, increasing the hydrochloric acid in your stomach and other digestive enzymes. So you might do this through a dietary supplement that has enzymes and hydrochloric acid in it to kind of boost your, your own enzymes. You can also try digestive bitters. And so digestive bitters are made from herbs. So one of my favorites is dandelion. And these bitters act on your bitter receptors in your digestive tract. And then they help to stimulate the release of digestive enzymes. So just doing something, you know, as simple as digestive bitters before you eat can really help increase um, enzymatic activity. And then 
Um, another thing that is very popular is to use apple cider vinegar. That can be very beneficial because apple cider vinegar is, is acidic. And so a lot of people will take just a small amount, you know, and it's going to depend on everybody, but you know, a teaspoon to a tablespoon, you mix it in with some water, you drink it prior to meals, and that can help to raise the stomach acid in your stomach. So we want to remove anything that might be irritating the stomach. We want to, um, you know, replace any digestive enzymatic activity that isn't there, then you want to repopulate the bacteria in your gut. Okay. And this can involve taking supplemental probiotics, which I think a lot of people have heard about these days and are taking, or you can do it through foods that help to restore these beneficial bacteria. And so what we call, you know, your probiotic rich foods are your yogurts, um, kefir, fermented vegetables like sauerkraut, kimchi, okay? And so all of these foods that are fermented actually help to um, bring diversity and improve the gut microbiome. But once you, <clears throat> excuse me, you, once you it start to increase these good bacteria in your gut, you have to feed them and you have to support them. And you can do this by eating a lot of what we call prebiotic foods or prebiotic fibers in your diet. And, they're, and these fibers are what actually nourish the bacteria in your gut and allow them to flourish and to grow. So some samples of examples of a prebiotic food are things like apples and asparagus and garlic and onions and and jicama and leeks. So all of these foods have wonderful fibers that nourish the gut. We also then need to repair that gut lining, that one cell thick gut lining um, that may have been damaged by inflammation. And so you need certain nutrients to repair that. So nutrients like um, zinc and vitamin A and D and C, and particularly the amino acid glutamine um, is really important. And then also taking some antioxidants and anti-inflammatory nutrients can help decrease inflammation. So, you know, and again, you know, your fruits and vegetables are your primary antioxidant, anti-inflammatory nutrients. So I think, you know, just really making sure that you're getting enough fruits and vegetables in your diet, that alone is going to help the the gut microbiome immensely by supplying it with the fibers that these bacteria need to nourish themselves, as well as providing antioxidants and anti-inflammatories to calm down inflammation in the intestines. And then lastly, like we were talking about before, a healthy gut system cannot be sustained without maintaining a balance of the whole person. So we talk about rebalancing yourself through nutritious diet and appropriate exercise. And when we talk about appropriate exercise, you know, over-exercise is just as bad for you as, as no exercise at all. So, and then making sure that you get rest and sleep and manage your stress levels, all of these things, you know, everything goes hand in hand. And that's why we call it integrative health, because it's not just about this or that or the next thing. Everything in the body affects everything else. And, you know, I used to tell my kids, no cell is an island of its own. Every cell in the body affects every other cell. So, you know, and I, I think one of the, the worst things that we've done for ourselves in, in modern medicine is to separate the body into systems. We have the cardiovascular system and the neurologist, you know, neurologic system and kidneys and this and that and the next thing. And yet everything affects everything else in the body. So you have to take a whole body picture to health. And certainly you prioritize it. So, you know, if stress is a huge issue in, um, in your life, it's certainly going to affect the gut microbiome. And maybe you prioritize um, becoming more stress resilient. And the reason why I say resilient is because none of us are ever going to be stress free, but it's being able to manage stress so that it does not create problems in the system. So, you know, through things like meditation and yoga and exercise or prayer, or whatever it is that brings you joy and happiness helps to reduce your stress levels. 
couldn't agree with you more. And I, I love your approach because I, it's what I practice as well. And, and it worked. That's the exciting thing. Do you want to just tell us what you've seen? Because, you know, you've been working with us, people with osteoporosis and osteopenia for a long time, utilizing this approach. So I think if everybody listening, that's the good news. It's mm -hmm. it, that when, when you do address the gut and when you do approach it from a whole body approach, not mm -hmm. just your bones get better, but your whole life gets better. Well, your whole life, but, but also there's a huge connection between, you know, the gut brain and and we see that it, people with issues in the in the gut tend to have you know more mood disorders brain fog and and again we're dealing with a population and i hate to say that this is aging and and part of the you know one of our concerns with aging surely it's is the bones but it's also the brain too and so you know when you heal the gut and you can get nutrients to every cell in the body you are going to be able to support and protect every cell in the body, whether it's a brain cell or a liver cell or a kidney cell or a bone cell. So, um, you know, what I see people just feel better. Um, and, and that's the most important thing. If, if people are feeling better and, and eating better and digesting better, um, you know, normal bowel movements, their energy levels go up, which then in turn allows them to do more exercise, which is also important to the bones, but they're happier too, right? And when you don't feel well, you aren't happy. <laughs> um, and, and again, um, you know, so much of our health stems from um, our moods and for more happiness. And uh, I'm a huge believer that the body follows the mind. And if you're depressed all the time and, and, you know, just not feeling good, that's going to affect your body as well. But if you, you know, you feel good, you have a more positive outlook on life, then that is a positive message you're sending to every cell in your body. And your, your body will respond, the cells in your body will respond positively. Love that. And the research supports that happier people have improved bone density. So it's, it's just such a win-win. So you have a special gift for everybody or a webinar that every, can you tell everybody about that? Yes. Yes. So I put together a webinar. It's about 35 minutes long and it's called the gut bone connection. And it goes into more in-depth information on exactly how this gut system, the, you know, digestion, absorption, gut microbiome, affect the bones and um, what you can do about it. And so just a more in-depth look at exactly how our gut affects our bones. Yeah, and it's really wonderful. I watched it, I thought it was great. Oh. You know, what I like about it is that it's simple and mm -hmm. you get to the point and you can understand it. So I think I, I think that's very important because sometimes the concepts are might be over someone's head. And, and then if it's over your head, you lose it. You just, mm -hmm. it, it's hard to keep focusing, but you really do a great job of explaining oh, that. And thank then you. if people want to get in touch with you, what's the best way? So you can just reach out to me at Susan at Nurtured bones, N-U-R-T-U-R-E-D bones.com. And the webinar is called, but, uh, but <laughs> gut bone connection.com. So you can go to gut bone connection.com and that's where you will find the webinar. And I'll have all those links in the show notes as well. And you do see people for telehealth also. Yes. Okay. Telehealth as well as, as one-on-one. -on -one. Great. That, that's wonderful. Is there anything else then we, we can go on and on? Is there anything we missed in this discussion? But I think it's so important that we start with the gut and everybody realize that this is an essential piece yes. of not only their bones, but their overall health. And really you can't, because don't you find a lot of people are like, oh yeah, my whole family's constipated or oh yeah, I've had this my whole life. No big deal. Well, it's a huge deal. And we need to address that if you're really going to make a difference for your bones, as well as your overall health. And as you said, your happiness, which is the foundation of everything I do as well. So is there any last minute things you want to leave everybody with? Um, you know, I think the only thing is, yes, I do believe that the gut is the foundation of all health. Um, and it needs to be corrected before you can be any aspect of, you know, your body is healthy. But I think, you know, the other important thing is 
it has to be a total body approach. It's not just about taking calcium. It's not just about, you know, exercise. It's not just about supplements. It has to be a whole body approach. And yes, we will prioritize, you know, what's the, you know, what we see is the most important thing that might be missing in your bone health program. But in the end, it is about every aspect of your health. Couldn't agree more. Well, thank you so much for taking the time. It's been such a pleasure and I love the work you do. So thank you for really making a big contribution to everybody and just, you know, and just continuing to spread this important information. So thanks so much. Well, thank you. And thank you for having me. And as you can tell, I'm very passionate about this. So I love the opportunity to be able to get this out to your audience and, and, um, help them understand better about, you know, their bones and how to take a holistic approach to their bone health. Oh, well, thanks so much. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed my interview with Susan. Now a better understanding of how important our gut health is when it comes to our bones and overall health. All the links that Susan talked about will be in the show notes. So thanks so much for tuning in. And I look forward to seeing you on the next episode.